Next, on Viewpoint. Why does it seem bad things happen to good people? That pain, we use a, the pain gauge and uh, we determine the goodness of God or whether he's good or bad in, in, you know, based on how uncomfortable I am. And this author and pastor says it's not shame on you, it's shame off you. Because I think we got caught up in the mindset and we felt like it was our job to convict people. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. We know God is a good God. Nothing is impossible with God. He's God. But why do bad things happen to good people? With me is Pastor Walt Shepard. And uh, that's a question a lot of people ask. We, we see tragedies happen to people that you think, well, they were doing such good things. They were, they were good people. They were talented people. They were living for God. Why did this bad thing happen to It's a that? tough question, Bob. That's, uh, that's one of those questions as a pastor I hear a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, how could God let this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? And uh, I, I got to answer it, the, we, a couple of, a couple of uh, overarching uh, uh, effects to this question, uh, especially when those are in the West. We, we, have this, uh, we have this mentality here that, you know, if I'm in pain, then God is not as good as he was. If I'm painless, then God is good. Everything's good. Yeah, yeah God yeah. is good, yes. And so we have that pain, we use a, a, the pain gauge and uh, we determine the goodness of God or whether he's good or bad, in, in, you know, based on how uncomfortable I am. We interpret a lot of things in life that way. You know, you have a bad financial issue, you, th you think God's punishing you for some reason and things go good and you think, well, well I must have done something good. And it's that good and bad, I, my performance it's, mentality. And it's point. totally logical, uh, in fact, when the disciples came and, uh, and they were wanting to know that there's a blind man here and, uh, and they asked him over there in John 9, uh, who did sin, uh, yeah. this man or his parents that he was born blind. They thought somebody had to have committed some horrible sin for this guy. Gotta to be, be somebody's blind. fault, you know? Uh -huh. And his answer was neither, you know, but for the glory of God. And so sometimes there's suffering, but the suffering is, cannot be traced to a direct uh, calls humanly, mm -hmm. but there is, an, uh, there is a reminder when we're in pain, when they're suffering, when we see tsunamis, we see terrorist attacks, innocent people being killed, uh, pillaged, rape, murder, and the list goes on mm -hmm. of what man has to... Horrible things. Horrible things, diseases, and we can go through a list. I had, and to answer this, my, my, uh, I was a youth director for a, a number of years uh, when I first got into the ministry at a Bible college. We had a good kid named Jesse, and Jesse couldn't feel his legs. And Jesse would um, go to youth activities, and he had two crutches, uh, and he would just basically uh, drag his legs mm -hmm. everywhere he would go. And the teenagers, he was just part of the crew. And one night we were out there in a campground, uh, and uh, we're just singing and praising the Lord. And, uh, and one of the kids jokingly said to him, Jesse, your feet are in the fire because he can't feel yeah. anything in his, in his legs. And he, he pulled his legs back with his arms and, and we all laughed and he laughed and it was, it was kind of a collective, mm -hmm. wow, Jesse, boy, he says, you gotta deal with that. He says, yeah, he says, I cannot feel anything. So his feet really were in the fire. They had, no, they weren't in the they fire. They weren't in the fire. He just pulled them away yeah. thinking they were in the fire. And here's the thing, Jesse says, I wish I could feel my legs, even though, though it would be painful to feel my legs because I would know when something's wrong. And, and mm -hmm. here is a good part here is that, that the, the, when, when suffering and hardships and pain hits us, it reminds us that something's wrong. something's wrong. We have a sin cursed world starting in Genesis chapter three and we're reminded that because of the sin, there's death, there's sorrow, there's agony, and we have a loving God that has done something mm -hmm. about it. He but provided it, Jesus Christ. It wouldn't necessarily be that, that we have a sin that's caused us, uh, that, that God is punishing us because of this sin. Right. It wouldn't be that. No. It's it, a, we just know that we live in a fallen world. Right. And bad things are going to happen to the, the good and the evil. That's right. Uh, when, when a man would do something uh, provocative to a woman, that man, though he is defiled, biblically defiles someone else with his sin. Sin is an infectious disease that we're all born with mm -hmm. and it is uh, in the, in starting in Genesis chapter 3 all the way down through the centuries, wars and sorrows and anguish and, and pain because one day it's all going to be over. And the, the Apostle Paul's response to trials, the Bible, he says, fiery trials. These are difficult mm -hmm. th things and, and you go through a list of what Paul had to go through 
And he says, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. There is a good day, a great, the day, great coming, day coming. And all these trials and difficulties and hardships and the pain, it cannot be compared, the Bible says in Romans 8, uh, the sufferings cannot be compared with, with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And, and Christ warned us, he says, he says you're in, in this world, you're going to have trouble yeah. in this world. Because he knew that this world, he knew it from the very beginning when he was there in, yes. the, in the garden. He knew that this world was now sin-cursed. It was a fallen world. Yes. And we're all going to incur, incur some of these things as part of the crossfire of that battle right. that's going on in the world right now. And I think the, a, a good way to respond is when you're in suffering, the Bible says, I am nigh or close to those that are of a broken heart. You know, it's one thing to praise God when everything is good. But you praise God when everything is bad in your life. There is a closeness and there is a, a, uh, a gentleness that comes with the Holy Spirit that guides you through those times and glorifies God because you trust Him. It's an issue of faith that how, this is all going to be over one day. How about the other side of that where somebody can't praise God in, in, in the situation that they're in, whether it's pain or whether it's some kind of suffering, and they begin to blame God or they question God or they ask, God, how could you do this? Or they want to grab a hold of God and say, how could you let this happen? What about that prayer? How do you respond to somebody that, that is so angry at that point in time because they're, they're blaming God for what they're in? Well, I'll say this, even throughout the Bible, when good people like David uh, or even like Jonah, uh, you can find good people when they went through bad times and when they came to God uh, wondering why God was doing what he did and, uh, and the questions why and how long, Lord, and all those legitimate logical questions. There was never a rebuke from God to them. Uh, God has no problem with people that are suffering coming to him, even in anguish, and saying, God, why? Uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, we have an ex example there in the book of Job, where Job went through a horrible trial, mm -hmm. lost his children, lost his wealth, lost his health. And then his wife came to him and said, Job, curse God and die. Yeah. And she'll always be remembered as Job's wife. You know, and then you have Job who praised God, and then he said, though he slay me, yet I'm going to trust him. I'm going to still trust him through this time. And we have Job blessing, uh, God blessing Job in the latter part of that book. And of course, Job's wife got the blessing too. So I would say to those people, even though there's a temptation to, to cry out in agony with questions, it's okay to do that. But come back to God, to, to the Bible, and say, what and who is this God that I'm anguished and and, and angry with and get comfort from the scriptures and let the scriptures in, encourage and strengthen you and strengthen your faith. And we do have an enemy. He's prowling about seeking whom he can devour. We do have this enemy who will throw those questions around either through friends or someone else that why would God do this? God must not be very good. He must not love you anymore. Why, you know, God is doing this to you. I say uh, Ephesians chapter 6 will answer that question when we're reminded that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, rulers of the darkness of this world. But it says we're to take the shield of faith. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is basically the word of God. We're to take the shield of faith, the promises of God's word. We have the sword of God's word. But the shield of faith is that when those fiery darts, and those fiery darts hurt, yes, his accusations, he's an accuser of the brethren and accuses us before God day and night. And he says, if God loves you, why would he do this to you? And you have that shield that says, I am a child of God, and He loves me, and He purchased me with His own blood. And that, that quenches, the Bible says, the fiery darts mm -hmm. of the wicked. And so I would answer those that uh, have, have those accusations and those horrible, horrible uh, thoughts that come to their mind and heart about who God is and why He's doing what He's doing, to come back to a promise and quote a promise, as Jesus did to the mm -hmm. devil in the wilderness when He was being tempted. He went... As it is written, went right back, back to the to Bible. The word. Back, back to the, the Bible. Word. This book right here is is our, our is God's love letter to us. Yeah. It is our guidepost through life. We have to have this going through especially fiery trials. Coming up next. Those words, words have power, and those words shape our mindsets and our, our philosophies and our guilt and our shame. This author and pastor says it's not shame on you, it's shame off you. Next. The church is supposed to be a place for hope and for forgiveness. Why do so many people who are believers, why do they keep struggling with the past? And joining me is Pastor Rob Yannock to talk about this because people are, I mean, there's, you walk into some churches and there's some people that are still carrying the baggage or, or living in shame somehow. And 
Well, why is that? Why can't we just let go? And this church is a place for forgiveness and hope. Absolutely. Bob, first of all, I'm glad to be here with yeah. you today, and it's an honor to just give my opinion on some of this. We're looking for your viewpoint, that's okay. for sure. Okay, well, my viewpoint is pretty simple, is because the church went down a wrong path. We thought it was our job for behavior modification. So right. it was our job to try to change people's behaviors. Well, I mean, we've got, a, we've got a scripture that says if you find a brother in sin, right. then you should go to him and, and, and try to restore him. So have we just kind of over, overstepped our bounds? Have yeah. Taking the place of the Holy Spirit, maybe? Well, I think it's easier for people to criticize and condemn people who don't do what they think they should mm -hmm. do, whether that's a mistake or a sin. And uh, so the church has been condemning, and, but there's a, a, a grace that's coming. And I think people, I, people have a comment they'll make if you invite them to your mm -hmm. church. Oh, no, man, if I go in there, man, the, the, the roof is going to cave in. <laughs> I've done know? too much. I've gone too yeah, far. Yeah, I'm going to go to hell. Yeah. I can't. No, people need to know there is therefore now no condemnation. People need to be free from being condemned. And I think the church needs to be encouragement, not about con condemnation. So has the enemy used Use that to drive people out of church? Oh, absolutely. Because they don't measure up. Mm -hmm. Religion has painted the picture that we have to measure up to not God's standards, but to the yeah. church's standards. Well, you look at, you look at, I mean, we've got to go to Christ. We've got to look at Christ in this. He goes to the woman at the well and he's, and, and we, we would judge that woman. We would judge her as whatever. She's committed this sin, she's committed that sin, she's living with all these men. Christ saw her with compassion. Oh, he was the example of what the church should be like, mm -hmm. of what Christians should be like. And even the disciples were so upset with him because he was sitting having a conversation because they were considered the low life of society, mm -hmm. the dogs. And, you know, holiness back then was described on who you yeah. hung around and who you ate with and who you drank with. Mm -hmm. So if, if, where, where's it coming from? I mean, the shame. I mean, people say, well, it's, it's in the past. Forget it. Don't look in the rearview mirror. But Satan is a, like a roaring lion. He's looking around for people he can devour. What, what's the advantage here for Satan to, to keep that shame boiling up inside of us? Well, first of all, it's two, <laughs> it's two part. Uh, one, we... Uh, rehearse it in our minds and we deal with the mm -hmm. guilt and the shame. I remember growing up and doing stuff I shouldn't do and, you know, shame on you, Robbie. Yeah. You know, and so those words, words have power and those words shape our mindsets and mm -hmm. our, our philosophies and our guilt and our shame. So it dawned on me about six years ago in the middle of a service speaking on grace and teaching on this, I just said, shame off you. If somebody put shame on you, I've come today mm -hmm. to tell you, shame off wow. you. And I watched grown men begin to cry because of that freedom that they came in because they lived with shame because of whatever they did. Do, do we think uh, in general that we have to carry that? I mean, it, it's, I, I did it, I did it wrong. It's either sin or it's some act I committed or some scar in my life. I did it, I gotta carry it. Oh, absolutely, the most difficult place of forgiveness is us forgiving ourselves. You know, we're forgiven. When Jesus died on the cross, he forgave everybody of every sin that would ever be committed. But we don't yeah. forgive ourselves. But do we, do we not forgive ourselves because we think what Christ did wasn't sufficient? Right. We don't, we, we truly don't believe in Jesus. If we truly is, is believe... That, is that, is that the, the point? Is that somehow we can't forgive ourselves because we really don't believe what Christ did counted for us? I think so. And I think it's a trust issue. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We just don't, you know, I've, t I've had conversations uh, with Christians that do not believe that we are saved by grace, that they actually feel like I have to work and I will yeah. deserve to be there. And they don't realize that we're saved by grace, not of our works. So there's nothing we can do or don't do. He saved us. So there's not some penitence we have to do. There's not some, some baggage we have to carry that we've got to somehow suffer under that. Well, I think when, when the Bible talks about repentance, mm -hmm. uh, I think the religious definition, people thought, well, I got to say I'm sorry. No, the truth of it, that script, that means change your mind, mm -hmm. change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And the thinking needs to say, you know what? I've messed up. I blew it. I sinned. But you know what? Thank God Jesus mm -hmm. forgave me. Yeah, I, I remember a film uh, probably maybe 20 years ago. Now. I can't even think of the name of it. 
a, a man had committed all this. He, he'd gone to the South America, had, had killed a lot of people. He was a con conquistador. And he finally, he, he got saved. He, he got this relationship with Christ, but he felt he had to carry all of this armor with him all the time. He's climbing up this mountain with all this armor on. He had to carry it yeah. as a penitence for, for what he had done wrong. And he finally, at some point in time, uh, one of the natives just took it and threw it off of him and threw it over the falls. And yes. All this lightness came in. I saw the movie too and I can't, I, I can't remember, remember what it is. Uh -huh. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. Exactly. The, the load that we carry mm -hmm. is usually self-inflicted. But I'm just, my opinion is this, Bob. I think the church has helped keep that load on people. Mm -hmm. And really, we need to be people that set people free. Well, why, is, why is that... Uh, why is the church, I mean, when we say the church in general, but yeah. why, why has that happened in the church? Why does it, the church feel like they're the agent of reminding someone of who they, who they once were or what they once did? Because yeah. I think we got caught up in the mindset and we felt like it was our job to convict mm -hmm. people. And it's not our job to convict people. It's not our job to condemn people. The Holy Spirit does the mm -hmm. convicting. And, and listen, I know I, I was I was a, attacked one time for preaching on grace, and they said, <laughs> they said, Rob, if you <laughs> excuse me, but okay, okay, <laughs> if you preach grace, you're giving people a license to sin, a license and I'm to like, sin. a license to sin. I said, I don't need a license to sin. I'm going to sin if I want to sin. Naturally, yeah, exactly. And it's so, no, man. I'm here to help set people free. Yeah. Is there something, I mean, if someone's suffering in church right now, someone's out there and they're watching you and they say, but you don't understand, Rob. You don't know what I did. God can't forgive what, I, what I've done. And I, I can't live with it. Uh, he can't forgive me. I can't forgive myself. I don't even want to talk about it. Is there a sin that God's not going to... Nope. There is nothing that his... his, his when he died on the Calvary, when he died on the cross, mm -hmm. and everybody's familiar with that, it took care of the world's sin once and for all. That's what, and Paul talks about that, mm -hmm. that it is, it is taken care of. So, no, the, you are forgiven. Okay, they hear that. Now, how do they take that step and say, okay, I'm going to lighten the load. I'm going to take this off and throw it over the waterfall. I'm going I'm to live today as if I had never sinned because Christ has died for me. How do they even take that step now? They have to be reminded. That's where the scriptures come in handy. I really encourage people to just uh, fill their mind. Mm -hmm. When their mind is being overwhelmed with guilt and shame and condemnation, fill their mind with the scriptures. I mean, there's a scripture in the Psalm, and if anybody can talk about how shameful they felt, it David, was David. David could do it. But he says, as far as the east is from the west... He's removed yeah. my transgressions and he doesn't remember my sins no more. God has Alzheimer's mm -hmm. when it comes <laughs> to people's sins and mistakes. Yeah. I love that east from the west because at one time a, a pastor was describing, if you go north to south, you're eventually going to go north again. Yeah. I mean, if you're going down south, but if you go east to west, you're always, you know. Always going around. You, you, you can't come back exactly. together. Exactly. But at that point in time, they, how do you not pick it up again? And you walk into the church and you see all these people sitting around. They must all be holy. And I, I'm the only one here. I must stand out like a sore thumb. How do you, how do you just take that next, next step the next day? Well, I what think, reminds you each day to, to walk without the shame? I think people who are struggling with shame and guilt need to hear us be authentic and mm -hmm. honest with our struggles, with our past mistakes, with our current struggles. You know what? They're not looking for perfection. And God's not looking for perfection. He wants them to know. He'll work with them and walk mm -hmm. with them every step of the way. So when we explain to people, I've been there. I've done that. Oh, I've messed up. If you mm -hmm. want to be honest, I'll talk to you about some of my sins yeah. that I've committed. That, yeah, I'm still reminded of it. But I am convinced, and you need to be convinced, mm -hmm. that God doesn't remember them. Well, well then speak to that, that, that person in the pew who's going to remind somebody of that. Who yeah. think that they think that that's their, their, their calling, that's yeah. their gift, is to remind somebody, I, I know what you did, and, and you, you know. Yeah. Oh, they probably need to get <laughs> saved all over again. <laughs> you know what? I they really, don't understand the grace message. No, they, they yeah. don't understand about God's grace or God's mercy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even had a, a conversation with an individual who said, well, I haven't sinned in 30 years. Wow. Well, man, that's great. 
but I don't believe it. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> you know? pride in that. And you know what, but I think it comes from the top down. Mm -hmm. I think if we as pastors and leaders would just be honest and authentic and be gracious and kind and merciful to people, mm -hmm. when they mess up, when they fail, when they sin, when they blow it, I think that'll affect the church and affect mm -hmm. Christians within the church to help be that right. way also. And if you know somebody that's, in this case, living in sin or they're, they're in the middle of that, how do you approach them? If it's, a, if, if it's been a brother yeah. in Christ, how do, you, how do you approach that person without condemnation, but at the same time with the grace of God? Well, I always ask a question. Mm -hmm. How's everything working out for you? Yeah. And usually they answer with the answer they need to hear themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, no condemnation comes from me. Pastoring now for 24 years, I've had people in our church that have lived together and we're not married, you know, and I've had people come and say, you, you need to ask them one, either to leave the church mm -hmm. yeah. or get married. And my response is no. Yeah. If they're going to be anywhere, I want them in the church because guess what happens? If they hang out long enough in a non-condemning atmosphere, they'll get married. When they experience God's mercy, God's love and God's grace and they hear what the Word of God declares, they're going to get married. And guess what? 100% of the time. So it's not a license of sin, it's a license to marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But there is somebody out there who's saying, uh, you, you just don't know. I, I, I need prayer right now. I need yeah. to get that shame. I need to step out today. Today's got to be the first day that I can walk without that shame. Would you pray for them? Oh, absolutely. Because I, I know there's people out there that, that are walking with that. Okay. And they want it off of them. They want to feel that, that, that grace. They want to feel that that lightness that comes from, from uh, knowing Christ has, has taken that, that's yeah. nailed to the cross. Well, first let me tell you, if that's you today, it's very simple, shame off you. The Bible said there's, there's no more condemnation. I know you feel condemned. I know you feel shameful and guilt has plagued your mind, but I've come to tell you that you have been forgiven and God has forgiven you. And I just pray right now that, the, that you will experience God's mercy and God's grace in your life and realize that you no longer have to feel that guilt, shame, or condemnation. Amen. Amen. Th thank you so much. Yeah. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate the viewpoint on getting that shame off. People need to walk without that condemnation. Absolutely. Thank My you. pleasure. Well, thank you for joining us today. We'd like to hear your viewpoint. Visit our website and our Facebook page, and we'd love for you to share this program with your friends. Now, here's a look at what we have for you next week on Viewpoint. In today's fast-moving culture, why are so many saying they have gotten bored with Jesus? I already see in some ways uh, our culture is beginning to react to uh, it always needs to be new, glitzy, something that's brand new, because we realize that at, we're, we're amusing ourselves to death. We're, we're really amusing ourselves into uh, a melancholy culturally. That's next week on Viewpoint.